Are you guys ready to start church? <laughs> Sorry about that. I was talking. My, the clock on the pulpit, pulpit time now says nine o'clock. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but that's what I'm. Go, that's when I'm going to stop preaching. So, <laughs> so um, I want to welcome everybody here this morning. I thank everybody so much for being here. Um, I do want to let you know um, we have a new newsletter out. You can pick the newsletter up off the table there on your way out if you want to check out what's going on. We got some some good announcements in there. Talks about Bible school. Got a date for that. Talks about Easter and looking forward to Easter. One of the things we're looking forward to a month from today is Easter Sunday. So I hope you're looking forward to Easter. One thing we're looking forward to on Easter morning is Easter together. We're going to have both of our services combined on Easter morning. We will meet at 10 a.m. here in the Family Life Center, both services combined. And so we'll set up some more chairs and we'll spread things out and we'll keep things socially distanced as we have been. But we're looking forward to, and I know you guys are looking forward to uh, seeing the folks from the other service and the other folks are looking forward to seeing and you guys and being together on Easter morning at 10 a.m. So be looking forward to that and be looking forward to Easter together. You know, I've had some people in the second service have asked about you guys. How's Roberta doing? Is she back in church yet? And I'll, Roberta's here every week, you know, things like that. So um, it'll be good to be together and for us all uh, to see each other and to, to worship together on Easter morning as we celebrate um, celebrate that morning. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we have our small groups listed there as well and, and some tips and things like that. So make sure you pick up the newsletter on your way out today. So we thank you for doing that. We're going to open today with a word of prayer, a time of preparing your hearts for worship. This is also a time in which you can give your tithes and offerings. Um, those are in the basket right in front of you right there. And so if you see the basket in your section of chairs, you can give your offering there. If you're joining us online, we thank you so much for doing that. And you can give through our website, which is www.phbcmv.org. And so uh, you can go there and click on Give and Give Online, even if you're joining us, uh, joining us through Facebook this morning or YouTube. So we thank you for doing that. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. If you would, join me as we pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we could be together, that we could worship together. I thank you for a place where we can come and worship you safely and, and worship you fully, Lord. I pray that as we sing songs to you that they would be worshipful. I pray as we listen to your word that you would open our hearts and minds to what you have to teach us, Lord. I pray that you be with every aspect of our service today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Stand if you would, please, and join us as we sing.
one for you this morning called My Hand. song runs into another one and that'll be the last before Pastor Jason comes. Friend, I 
you might have seen Mary have to give me a little signal. Hey, I was just, I was just worshiping in there. I was just enjoying, I knew as the deer was my cue, but I was just, I don't know, I was enjoying it. I was enjoying the songs and I was just worshiping. And God was like, that's nice, but you got preached in a second. So start walking. So um, we wrapped up our series last week on trust. And um, I so enjoyed looking at that and talking about that. We may explore more. I can't promise anything. We'll do what God wants us to do, okay? Um, we're going to prepare. We're going to start a new series. We're going to begin preparing our hearts and, and preparing for Easter. Easter is coming, and it's coming fast. Coming here in a couple weeks. Next week, we spring forward. Oh, man, those of you that are here for the 9 o'clock service, that's going to be an early morning, isn't it? And so we spring forward. Uh, we spring forward next weekend, and then East, uh, the spring season is coming, and um, so we're, we're getting ready for all that. But over the next few weeks, we're going to look at a sermon series that I'm calling The Faces of Easter. Scripture is an interesting book because as we read through Scripture, we see people who are major players, but many times they're introduced just with a small mention. We, we get just a little hint of who they are before they lead up to the point where they're a major player in Scripture. When we first read about Paul, he's simply standing on the outskirts, and later, of course, he becomes a major player in Scripture. When we look through, as, we, as we're studying the book of Genesis, we see this happening with different people. It'll, it'll mention someone, and then they become a patriarch. We, we see them growing. We just, in our, on our Tuesday night, we're meeting Tuesday night. We'll be here at 6.30 if anybody wants to join us for our Genesis study. We just introduced a new character by the name of Joseph. I think that he's going to be important. And so uh, we're going to study about that in the coming weeks. But today we're going to look at one of these people who will have a major role in Easter and who gets a little bit of an introduction here and a little bit there. And we learn more and more about him as, as we look at the life of John. And we're going to look at John, who is often called the beloved disciple. John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as the book of Revelation. When a new believer comes to Christ, many times we tell them a great place for them to start is the book of John, right? Read the book of John. That's a great place to start. You can even get copies of the book of John that is just the just bound copy of to give to a new believer, to give to someone who is seeking, and, and we give that to them. But how much do we really know about John himself? If people asked you questions about John, would you be prepared to answer them? We point people to that book, but what do we know about John? If, and actually, interestingly enough, the place to look to learn about John is not the book of John. Because John doesn't even call himself John. Throughout the book, he calls himself the beloved disciple. His name isn't even there. Later on, he identifies himself, but, but over and over, he says the beloved disciple. He leaves his name out of it. And so as we're going to look today, we're going to see John and see some things about John, see what we can learn from the life of John. When we talk about him on Easter, we have a better picture of who he is. John was actually one of the earliest followers of Christ. And we know that John and his brother James were followers of Christ. You may be the, familiar with them, the story of them fishing with their father, Zebedee. What a fun name to say. And Jesus called them. But John was actually a follower of Christ before what we read about as the traditional calling of the disciples. If we look at John's gospel in chapter 1, we're going to see an account of two disciples. And we, we know that's John is John. And John doesn't call himself by name because he doesn't want to draw too much who is. John's gospel is on who this is. And that's what we're going to see about John's life in which he points 
again, we see John. It would be if we could leave a legacy of pointing to was standing with two when he saw Jesus passing by he said the Lamb of God the two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus when Jesus turned and noticed them following him he asked them what are you looking for they said to him, Rabbi, which means, where are you staying? Come and you'll see. Not because of who John was, not because of who his teacher was. John started following Jesus. Because of who he is. John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Look, there is the Lamb of God. And Andrew and John follow Jesus, immediately calling him rabbi, which means teacher. Now, this whole encounter here is bathed in humility. First, we have John the Baptist, and I know a story with two Johns is a little confusing. I'll try and keep them separate. But John the Baptist has a following. He has people who come to hear him preach. He has disciples. He has a crowd. These are two of his disciples with him, right? Instead, he points to Jesus and says, here's the one. Here's one who's greater than I. And so John is being humble. And then John and Andrew, they drop everything and they start to follow Jesus and listening to him. But right from the start... John knows it's not about him. It's about who Jesus is. This is something we as believers need to learn. We don't follow Jesus because of who we are. We don't follow Jesus because of what he can do for us. But we follow Jesus because of who he is. He is the Lamb of God. Now, he can change our lives, he does amazing things for us, but we worship him because he is God. He is the Lamb of God. And right here, John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God. And to call Jesus the Lamb of God is to call him the sacrifice. This turns everything on its head right from the start. You see, the Jews have been awaiting their Messiah. They've been awaiting a Messiah who would come and would overthrow this evil government that they're dealing with and get rid of the government and be their ruler and be their king, and that's what they want. That's what they've been waiting for. That's what they've been looking for. What they have not been looking for is a lamb. You see, they wanted someone that would come in and overthrow their oppressors and free them from the government. What they got was a lamb that would come and be their sacrifice to free them from the oppression of their sin. Isn't this so pictures of lambs. We're going, you may make a right? But do we think about the fact that lambs are a sacrifice? And to call Jesus the Lamb of God is to call him the sacrifice. Why is it good when we, when we reference Jesus as the Lamb, but then as an insult we would call 
I hear that a lot right now. People calling each other a sheep. But if we look to the Lord as our shepherd, then what does that make me? Right? Insult away. But Jesus is the Lamb of God, and that turns everything upside down. And while this might have been the first time that John listens to the teachings of Jesus, he's not yet a disciple. He's just a curious person hearing what this Lamb of God has to say. His calling comes later. To find that, we need to look to the book of Matthew. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this, actually, but we're going to look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, he being Jesus, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Now, if we place these two scriptures side by side, and we understand that, that Andrew and John had heard Jesus before, they were already disciples of John the Baptist, and they had heard Jesus preach before and teach before, it makes sense as to why when Jesus calls to them, they're willing to lay it all down and follow Jesus. This was not their first encounter, but this is the time in which the rubber meets the road. A crucial decision has to be made. A crucial decision that all of us will be faced with in our lives. Will we follow Jesus? Or will we keep doing what we've been doing? Maybe you've already faced this decision. Maybe it's a decision that you have to face every single day. The decision of, will we lay down our nets and follow Christ, or will we keep on fishing? Because Jesus says to them, follow me. And it means giving up everything they know. It means giving up all that they knew, everything about their identity. They were fishermen. That's what they were. Scripture tells us they were fishermen. They weren't just out fishing for fun. This was their livelihood, this was their job, this was their identity. And Jesus says, give it all up and follow me. Are we willing to give up our identity, give up who we think that we are, for the sake of following Christ? These four brothers were, four brothers, two sets of two brothers, I don't know, but Four, these four men were willing to set aside everything they knew in order to follow Christ. I remember when I returned from Africa. I had been out of college, went straight overseas, and I served. Uh, I served my term there, and it was wonderful. I had a great experience, and the time came that I returned home. And when I came home, I was overwhelmed by the American culture. They call it reverse culture shock because you're returning to your home culture, but you experience the culture shock of being here. Um, I remember there was a lot that was overwhelming. Um, going to Ryan's was a lot for me, that there was so much and so much wastefulness. But one of the biggest struggles I faced was I was no longer a missionary. And so much of my personal identity was wrapped up in that. Omu Mishana. That means I am a missionary. That's how I would introduce myself. Omu Mishana. It was on the truck that I drove, Baptist Mission of Uganda, right there. All of who I was was wrapped up in being a missionary, and I wasn't that anymore. One plane flight, and it was over. And I had lost sight of a lot of things. What was I now? I was 
living at home with my parents it was not good. I was a substitute teacher and a wannabe youth minister. Who was I? But during that time, I had the opportunity to really examine my relationship with the Lord and realize that I was finding too much identity in what I saw myself as and not enough in who Christ is and who I am in Christ. And I think that we can all get wrapped up in that. We all get wrapped up in who we are, what we do, what we think we are. And all of that's fragile. Right? Everything around us can be taken away. Except who we are in Christ. Nothing can take that away. You see, Jesus was making it not about who they were. He didn't say, you guys look like you are really good fishermen. Therefore, I want you to be my disciples. No, it wasn't about that, was it? He said, come and I will make you fishers of men. Fish for people. Set aside everything you know and come and I'll teach you something new. Once again, we see that it's not about who they were. It was about who Jesus is. And what do these men do? What do they do? They lay it all down. They lay down their nets. They walk away from their boat. And I know I've said this before, but I know we have some fishermen in here. Laying down your nets and walking away from your boat is a big deal. But make talk about John. James and John don't just walk away from their nets and walk away from their boat. There's something different for these two brothers. They walk away from their father as well. How many of us have ever had to face a decision like that? Maybe not too many of us. Where you're faced with the decision that if you follow Christ, it means abandoning and turning your back on your family. That's a hard decision, and I don't think that we can fully grasp it unless we have faced that decision ourselves. I have a very dear friend, and I know that he tunes in and watches our videos almost every week, so I think that he'll know that for him, following Christ meant a rift between him and his family. They said, if you do that, they actually said, if you go to that cult, the Baptist church, you can't come home again. How many of us have had to face and make a decision like that? But to make that decision, to me, is one of the hardest decisions to make. And to choose Christ over your family, I don't think it's something that we can fully understand, but that people in our world face that decision every single day. We say we're willing to forsake all else to follow Christ, but are we? How many of us would be like James and John and lay down our nets? And not just lay down our nets, but turn to our brother and say, let's go. Here we go, abandoning everything that we know. And see, on this day, we see the inner circle form. James and John and Peter. I don't know what Andrew did wrong, but. James and John and Peter, they quickly become the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. They gather around him and they get closer and closer to him. And I don't want to paint a perfect picture of them because in the next example we're going to see, they lost a little bit of their humility. At least James and John did. We're going to look at the book of Mark, chapter 10. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we Whatever do you ask them? And they answered, Allow us to sit at your right and at your left 
in your glory. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We are able, they told him. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I drink and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. Times we learn humility from a time not being very humble. Jesus, if they could sit at his right and left in eternity. And Jesus says, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that, guys. We're close. Can't you drink from the cup that I drink from? This was pre-COVID. And so he says, can't you drink from the cup that I drink from? Can't you be baptized in the same place that I'm baptized? Can't we do all of these things together? He's saying, look, you get to spend all this time with me here on earth. And how many of us today are jealous of that? But in eternity, it's different. And Jesus tells them what they already know, and that is that the Gentiles, they lord their authority over other people. They hold it over their heads, who they are. But he says, that's not. That's not how we're going to act. That's not how we as followers of Christ are going to behave. You know, sometimes I have conversation with my kids, and I'll say, in our family, we don't act like that, right? And I feel a little bit like that's how Jesus is, is doing. Okay, everybody come together. I know you're mad at your brothers over here because they asked this thing, and it made you mad, but here's the thing. That's not how our family's going to act, right? And instead, Jesus says, we're going to be humble. And Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. Because he says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You know, I remember when I first took over as senior pastor, there was a WMU event here. And so the WMUs from all over the association came, and we served them food, and um, I served the manicotti. We made manicotti, and I served the manicotti. And the main reason I served it was because we, did, we weren't sure people would know what to do, how to get a manicotti out without destroying the whole thing. And then at the end of the meal, I was doing dishes. And some of the WMU ladies came, and they were very sweet and very kind, and they said, oh, you know, the pastor doesn't do the dishes. And I said, I'll, I'll call out. It was Jan Ash. She's not with us anymore. I said, Jan, if Jesus can wash feet, I can wash dishes. And she said, I think I've been put in my place. <laughs> and I felt like, as a new pastor, putting Jan Ash in her place was quite an accomplishment. No, I'm joking. Um, but it's true, right? We place people on pedestals, and we think there's certain things that they shouldn't do. But Jesus said it's not like that. And Jesus taught James and John and all the disciples a very important lesson about humility that day. And I think with John, I think it stuck. Because as we read his gospel, he leaves his name out of it. He wants his legacy not to be about who he is, but about who Christ is. 
there's a, a song we used to sing. Mary asked me, is there a song that you want to sing? And I, I don't know if you saw me, I was like, mm, I don't think that's the right one, but we would sing it at church camp, and I remember we'd sing, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant to all. And it was, it's a song that has stuck with me. And it's the truth of Scripture that if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant to all. I think we make much of ourselves, our wants, our desires, who we are, when in reality we need to make much of Christ. And that's the lesson of our first face of Easter. The life of John is not about John. The life of John is about Jesus. Reminding each of us to look to Christ, to look to Christ as our sacrifice, to look to Christ as our identity, and to look to Christ as the ultimate example of service and love. Can we live a life in which we point not to ourselves, not to anything amazing that we've done, but to the amazing love of Christ? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray that that would be our example today. That the life of John, as he points to you, would be a life that we desire to live. A life surrendered and pointing to you. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for being our sacrifice, for being our identity, and for being our example. Lord, I pray that we love you more every day and that we learn from John. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And if you would.